Okay, I think we'll start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gordon Peake. I'm a visitor at the ANU School of uh, Regulation and Global Governance, and I'm delighted to be chairing this seminar today. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking on uh, Ngunnawal land, and I acknowledge their elders past, present, and emerging. And I was, as I said, I'm um, honored to be chairing this seminar um, of um, the work of three people whose work I, I respect uh, very much and and uh, they've uh, they've produced I think a really wonderful report um, about mobile phones and a project that took place in Bougainville uh, around the time of the referendum it's a very very good report I commend it to to everyone and I think what's really interesting about the report is that it talks about something that we very rarely talk about in international development, which is a project that did not work as well as we hoped that it would. There's so much celebration of um, announcements in international development. We very rarely talk publicly about what happened to projects after the uh, the MOU has been signed or the the gate has, or the uh, tape has been cut. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, format of this seminar, some housekeeping rules, and then I'm going to hand it over to our three speakers who are speaking, um, they're going to do a trapeze act. They're going to be speaking between Austria, uh, Buka, and uh, Canberra, where the three of them are. So this seminar will be recorded. Um, and barring any unforeseen circumstances, uh, the seminar will be available um, on the website and social media channels of the Department for Pacific Affairs in the next couple of days. The, our speakers are going to speak for about 40 minutes collectively. And then we're going to have 20 minutes for, for uh, question and answers. Um, you'll see at the bottom right of the Zoom screen, there's a little button called Q&A. Um, if you have a question that you would like uh, to, to ask, I'm going to field the questions. Um, then please put your question into, the, into that box, not into the chat function. Um, and we'll curate those questions and ask them to our participants at about at Canberra time, about 4.40. Um, PNG time uh, 3.40, um, it's 40 minutes from now. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to the first of our three speakers who are going to work in a uh, tag team over the next 40 minutes, and that's Adriana Schmidt. Adriana, over to you. Thank you, Gordon, and um, welcome everyone to this um, uh, webinar this afternoon. So before we get into the discussions on the telephone information service, I will briefly provide a quick background on the Bougainville Peace Agreement and the referendum. And I will also give a quick snapshot of communications in Bougainville. Firstly, the Bougainville Peace Agreement is a joint creation between the government of Papua New Guinea and the people of Bougainville. And it was signed in Arawa in 2001. Uh, the Bougainville Peace Agreement has three main pillars, and they are autonomy, weapons disposal, and referendum. The peace agreement was built on a Melanesian system of compromise. Uh, for example, the national government did not want to be bound by the result of the referendum. Also, different groups in Bougainville at that time had different views of self-governance. The Bougainville leaders and the PNG government then compromised and jointly agreed to having an autonomous arrangement with a referendum on independence 10 to 15 years later. The autonomy arrangements gave Bougainvilleans the authority to manage their own affairs and through the referendum determine their own future, while at the same time building a weapons-free environment to enable self-governance to grow. Over the years since the signing of the peace agreement, the two governments have continued to maintain the key principle of the peace agreement, and that is maintaining peace by peaceful means. Now, the, uh, the Bougainville Peace Agreement also allowed for a referendum to be held to determine Bougainville's political future once and for all. Uh, the Bougainville referendum is non-binding, meaning that the result of the referendum does not automatically become the final outcome for Bougainville. There will be government consultations between Papua New Guinea and Bougainville over the result, and then followed by the final ratification to be done by the National Parliament of Papua New Guinea. The Bougainville Peace Agreement, however, did not provide a step-by-step -step process for the two governments to take. Um, 
to resolve the Bougainville issues. And therefore, a consultative approach was taken by the two governments in determining key elements of the referendum, such as the date and the questions to be asked in the referendum, and also uh, voting rights for non-resident Bougainvilleans. The delays in getting these key decisions agreed to by both governments also raised concerns among the public with fear of a deferral of the referendum itself, uh, confusion on key voter information, and also uncertainty of civil unrest uh, before, uh, during, or after the referendum. As a result, a strong approach to focus on effective, credible, and consistent referendum information was undertaken by various groups in Bougainville, um, including government parliamentary committees, um, the BRC, community governments, and civil society groups across Bougainville. Um, this built up the momentum of Bougainville ownership of the process. And this was clearly demonstrated in the high number of voter turnout and contributed largely to the credibility um, of the referendum process itself. Now, Bougainville is a difficult place to do effective communications. There is very limited reach of mass media in the communities and other factors such as um, poor road or telecommunications infrastructure also contribute to an overall lack of access to information. Studies have clearly shown that there is a strong community or public preference for better communications coverage across um, Bougainville and also face-to-face -face dialogues with government members and officials is also a preferred method of receiving information and also having, uh, having events that create the opportunity to have um, question and answer and interaction with the government. So all these factors clearly showed that there was a strong need for direct, consistent, and simple to understand government information on the peace agreement and the referendum. The poor infrastructure left a lot of black spots across Bougainville and factors such as low understanding and low literacy rates among key audience groups also contributed to public misconceptions. The referendum period itself in Bougainville created a highly political climate and there was a strong need for maintained peace and unity in the region. So the IVR or the telephone um, hotline service was seen as an innovative communication approach to address in its own way and capacity uh, the above mentioned issues. And also the decision to develop and use the hotline service was also based on audience feedback where um, just over 70% of people in Bougainville, um, they had access to a basic uh, 2G handset. So therefore, in light of the communication challenges above the telephone hotline service or the IVR was used as one of the communication tools in keeping Bougainville informed on a very direct level, um, as you will see in the next presentation. So I'll hand over now um, to the next panelist, Jeremy Miller, who will take us through this presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Adriana, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for uh, tuning in today. I'm going to talk to you about three things based on what Adriana's talked about, which was um, really the mobile platform that we used, um, the uh, interactive voice response uh, system, um, secondly, the plan that we, that we use for the whole project, and thirdly, which Gordon has alluded to, um, what was the reality with the plans implementation and just looking at some of the audience um, data that was provided by the telecommunications provider. So um, the, the system that we used was, as I said, um, an IVR or interactive voice response uh, system platform. And basically what that means is that for the user, um, they call a number, they listen to a, a menu of pre-recorded information, uh, they use their keypad to select a number between one and nine to listen to one of the messages, listen to the message, go back to the main menu, um, et cetera, et cetera. So fairly straightforward. There's a number of platforms that mobile platforms that are available, um, but we chose this one to really meet um, some of the, the, the communications problems and, and I guess the opportunities that Adriana talked about. And uh, I'm not sure if you're listening there, uh, Catherine Hyatt, but just a shout out to her uh, she was working with mobile women 
and uh, she really provided us um, some guidance in the initial initial um, stages for, for platform selection. So what did it look like in Bougainville? So the BPA hotline, as you can see on your screen there, we launched it with an automated robocall from, from the president himself. So people's telephones actually rang and, uh, and they, they heard a message, a greeting from, from the president. And the purpose of that was really something that Digicel alluded to us, alerted to us in the, in the initial stages, which was um, people can sometimes just delete SMS spam. So um, SMSs coming from uh, unregistered numbers that they don't know um, can just be deleted. So we wanted um, an active um, someone calling them. And we also knew that this was a new platform for Papua New Guinea. Um, so we wanted um, the script of the president really talked about how to use the system, the fact that um, people would be guessing, getting SMSs, the fact that it was a, a free service, um, that people should call it and use their touchpads to select the messages and really implored um, them to get themselves educated in the lead up to the referendum. So people to re were to receive a weekly SMS reminder and that had the, the toll free number to call, plus the fact that uh, the messages were being updated each week. Um, so people would ring that uh, toll free number and listen to those uh, options there to choose from and then they would choose uh, between one and four on their keypad and listen to a, a message which was between one and two, mess uh, one and two minutes long and all, they're all in talk prison. So let's have a listen to week's one referendum message. Referendum message will this week, one and something on referendum. Referendum may also want the election as a union or vote long and the candidate also want the money Mary no God. You need by vote long one play issue and long Bougainville by you need vote long future political status long union. Okay, so pretty straightforward there. So in, in total, um, with uh, across the eight weeks of the platform that it went out, uh, with the messages being repeat, um, updated each week, there was a total of, of over an hour's worth of audio information. And that information was based upon key messages that were sort of signed off um, at the highest level by the Prime Minister and President uh, Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea and President of Bougainville. So really um, based on what uh, Adriana was talking about, the collaborative approach of the BPA, um, we sort of had to, we, we followed that in terms of the content that was put on the platform. So we, we some of the, the, the selection of this, of this platform is really based on what Adriana talked about, um, getting into those um, communication black spots that weren't, um, that weren't receiving any information um, from sort of ma mainstream channels. And the audience research that um, Adriana alluded to um, it found in South Bougainville, for example, only 20% of the population was getting access to radio, um, whereas in Central it was 40%. So um, whereas mobile phone was get across Bougainville was, was getting into a lot of areas. So that was some of the reason. And so we were really trying to use this platform to be like a radio, to give people the same information at the same time. Um, for, for message consistency. Um, it was also about the people's desire to have uh, awareness come right down to their village and uh, for leaders to be talking directly to them. So we thought that this platform might help connect people in that way. So let's have a look at the plan, uh, the project plan and what actually happened. So it was meant to be, it was conceived in 2014. So along this project um, was a long time in incubation. Um, it got funded by the, um, a collaboration of the Bougainville Partnership, which is a collaboration of the governments of Bougainville, Papua New Guinea, Australia and New Zealand. Um, so it got funding in 2000 and late 2017, 2018, the contracts were signed with Digicel. And then it took almost two years to get the messages approved and really uh, leadership to give us the go to, to go live. Um, and so those massive delays um, really impacted upon the project. Um, two years, as I said, and 13 drafts with sometimes, you know, six months between a draft approval um, before we went up the line. And that was really um, politically necessary um, because of the, the sensitivities of, of the referendum and the fact that there was this collaborative joint government approach meant that we very much followed the lead of, of the leaders the, of, the two, of the two governments. And we didn't want this project, project to get ahead of the, what the political messages were. And the fact that, as Adriana said, some of the decisions, um, for example, the date of the referendum, um, who was gonna conduct the referendum weren't decided until reasonably late in the process. 
So as a result, um, after a very long time, it was actually quite rushed before um, launch. Uh, we went live um, literally the last week that we could, nine weeks before the referendum. Initially, we wanted to use well-known people for recordings just to get uh, that sense that people's leaders were talking to them. Um, so we, we had the president talking, but um, because of the lateness of the script sign-off, we went for voiceover artists. So that gave us great message control, but just didn't have the credibility to, for the audience. Uh, it was a free call service that's really based upon a lot of learning from other mobile phone projects uh, conducted in PNG and elsewhere, where call cost is really an impediment to users calling um, public information lines. The launch was meant to be um, signaled by the robo call from the president um, to promote people how to use the service. Um, we know from uh, Amanda, we'll talk to this later, that the, uh, some people didn't get the robo call and also the, the system, the, the network just crashed basically. So um, Digicel's network could not handle the 66,000 um, robocalls going out to handsets in, in Bougainville. And so they then went out in drips and drabs um, over, um, over a week. So that didn't really kind of give us our clean launch. Um, and as I said, this was the use of a robocall was the first time that it had been done in, in Papua New Guinea. So it was a first for Digicel to, to use. Um, the weekly SMS announcements, um, we know that they didn't go to all handsets. And again, Amanda will talk to this. Um, and as I said, the rushness meant that we couldn't integrate it into wider activities um, because for, for, for years, we didn't really know whether it had the political engagement to, to, to go ahead. Um, as a pilot, it was meant to be a pilot, so we wanted to do audience research to figure out what people thought of the service, was it effective? And thanks to Amanda for traveling to Bougainville just ahead of the referendum to do, to do the research. So how did it really work? Let's just have a look quickly at the data that was provided by Digicel. So um, 66 approximately active handsets in Bougainville. Um, over the course of eight weeks, almost 80,000 calls were made to the, the, the hotline. Um, some of those would have been from repeat people, um, but in total, 56,000 messages were listened to. So um, reasonably cost effective still, the total project was about 75,000 Australian um, and of about that 35,000 was just for the call costs. Um, to cover the call cost. So um, when, you, when you sort of compare that with, for example, a, a full page ad in the post Korea newspaper um, is about 4,000. Um, we're, we're getting some, some, some reach there for our, uh, for our dollar, but the, the data really tells another, another story. So um, this is the, the, the call data and 40,000 people, over 40,000 people called the service on the first week. So really strong uptake of the service. Um, but if you uh, look there on, on the left, 35% um, of those that called didn't actually get passed to listen to a message. So there's obviously problems there with people using their keypad, um, something to do with uh, navigating the menu, um, callers just dropped out. By week three, um, you can see their callers have figured out the tech. Um, the people number that are calling are actually listen to, listening to the messages, but look, we've a massive opportunity uh, there that we've lost. In terms of what they listen to, um, no surprises there. Um, predominantly referendum messages followed by peace building and autonomy. So we were satisfied that it provided the content that we thought that people were, were, were asking for in, in the audience research. So uh, just some key takeaways and we'll talk a bit about the, um, the so what at the end of this, uh, at the end of this uh, 40 minutes. Um, the plan was solid. Um, it was research based, but um, the, the politics and the, the newness of the technology as an innovation, um, we ended up dropping some of the, some of the, the planned activities um, and that really affected the, the, the implementation. Key barriers obviously still exist in, in Bougainville and I could, probably, I could sort of say in uh, Papua New Guinea as more broadly, um, the network was not, um, was not as promised by Digicel. It didn't provide, for example, the robocall or SMSs as effectively as, as it should. Um, and there's issues that Amanda will talk about in terms of people's uh, use of their phones and mobile literacy. Um, Innovations obviously clearly needs uh, more supporting awareness about how to use them, um, but it still does remain a cost-effective way to, to deliver information. 
to particularly to, you know, to information black spots. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand you over to Amanda to talk through the audience research that she conducted. Thanks very much, Jeremy. So I'm going to be talking uh, regarding research that was conducted based on a paper uh, that has already been published by the Department of Pacific Affairs by the three of us. Uh, and firstly, I'll explain a bit about the research method before turning to the findings. So this research aimed to find out people's views of the telephone service and specifically it aimed to determine its effectiveness. Secondly, to find out whether people felt that such a hotline should continue. And thirdly, to find out whether people thought if it should continue, whether there should be any changes made. So for this research, group interviews were conducted with women, youth and leaders. And this was chosen because group interviews through the conversation approach can generate rich information as they allow for debate and uh, people have to justify their positions if they're disagreeing with someone else. People can build on the ideas of others and ideas can emerge through that conversation. So I conducted the group interviews and I made sure that no other people were listening in or present. Uh, this photo here, by the way, is not real participants. It's uh, uh, important to ensure people's identities are kept confidential. So I didn't take photos of the actual participants, but this just gives you an idea of the kind of setup for the group interviews sitting in a circle. And for this research, research ethics clearance was granted from Australian National University and the usual research ethics practices and processes and principles were adhered to, in particular informed consent. So all of the participants were given a detailed explanation in top pissing verbally and their questions were answered and so on and discussed and it was made very clear to people that it was a voluntary thing that they could leave at any time, they didn't have to agree to participate and so on. Uh, people were also given information sheets with the contact details for me, Adriana, and the Australian National University's Ethics Committee as well. Uh, those who wished to participate did sign informed consent. So investigations with more than one person uh, are, con are considered group interviews, and these tend to be qualitative in nature. Now, qualitative research focuses on seeing through the eyes of the people being studied. This means that you are trying to share their perspectives and allow their voices to resonate through the research, typically through presenting quotes from the interviews. So qualitative data shows how people create meaning in their everyday life and allows the reader to read through the voice of the people from their perspective, from their viewpoint. So as group interviews tend to be qualitative in nature, this means that they're explicitly concerned to reveal how the group participants view the issues with which they're confronted. In this case, it was the impending referendum and what they thought about the hotline itself. So we had eight group interviews that were conducted with a total of 42 people. And these were conducted around the three regions of Bougainville. So South Bougainville, Central and North Bougainville. And the sample size was really good for quality research because, as I said, it generates such rich data uh, full of really wonderful, insightful quotes. So I'm going to turn straight to the summary of the research findings now, and there's more detail available in the published paper. Remember that I said that the first aim was to determine the effectiveness of the service uh, in delivering government information directly to people. Well, one way to test that was to determine whether people knew about it, and if they knew about it, had they used it, and if they had, how often and what did they think of it. So overall awareness of the telephone hotline was low, as is shown here in table one. 17 of the 42 people who participated in the research did not know about the hotline before they came along to a group interview. As one participant said, for the phone service, I can say we do not get it here. We do not have this service here, this phone service. We do not know about it. I was also surprised when I saw it here, referring to the research participant information sheet. Uh, this was in top pissing and uh, was obviously very clear and emphatic. And in fact, the hotline was available uh, to, to people, but obviously not everyone knew about it. Usage was also fairly low, with 12 of the people having been aware of it, but not having used it. As one participant said, sometimes we're busy. I just look and I say, oh, a message. And then I go and wash a piece of fabric or something like that. Oh, I'll cook first. And when I cook, I forget. 
as another person said, we were cruising, a message came in, I just looked and I went to get another thing with my friends. So some people knew about it, but didn't actually ring it. Six of the 42 people had called the hotline just one time. As one participant reflected, I phoned this number here, but I heard, but I felt busy to do all the work and I thought it was less important to me. So I did not whatever again, dial again. I pressed one and two, but after when I heard it go, I had no interest in it. So some people like this person had no interest. Uh, we also had other people who called one time uh, for other reasons, which is explained in the paper. Now, what you have on the screen now is about a small group who telephoned the service repeatedly. As one person said, my phone is on, usually on 24 seven. So it comes plenty of time and times and I ring back and listen. And I value, we do, it's a good thing, like it is information we all need. Also a small number of people had heard it through someone else's speaker. Uh, a handset speaker or a loudspeaker to which the signal was, was sent. As one person said, my father, every day he puts his referendum awareness, he turns it on and I tend to stay outside or outside of the house or I stay in the kitchen or I'm busy near my father's room and I tend to hear. All talk comes on the phone, on the referendum. So those were some quotes giving some of the feedback about people's awareness and usage of the hotline and there's more in the published paper. Uh, there were also some examples of the uh, community listening with one person saying they connected to solar, so they connected the, um, a loudspeaker to a solar system and they just turned it on. They put it on a boom box, connected a mobile to it and it became a special speaker. So in that case, there was a whole group of people listening, sitting around in a community space, listening to the audio of the messages. So the second aim was to recommend whether or not to continue the service. And this photo here is placed here deliberately so that you can see the kind of phones that people are using, just to remind you that uh, many of the people, as has been found in research by, Ver by Verena Thomas and her colleagues, uh, many people there have basic phones, what we call 2G uh, phones. Uh, and so despite low levels and knowledge uh, of the hotline, um, participants generally thought that it should be continued, but um, yeah, they're, they're using these kind of basic phones. So as one participant said, post referendum, we're not clear. So this service will really help to share about it, give us information about what's going on. How long will it take? Young people are, that's what they're all afraid of. What's going to become of them beyond 2020? So this phone service we really needed, it must go on, it must continue to explain to the people all the post referendum issues. That's my view, it must go on yet. So uh, then uh, just while I talk about the third aim, I'll show you another photo of some of the participants phones. Um, so the third aim of the research was to talk about and ask people's views on whether changes should be made to the hotline service. Suggestions were mainly, unsurprisingly, about increasing awareness of the service because people, uh, obviously, not everyone knew about it. And remember that a number of the people who had not heard of it actually thought it was a good idea when they learned about it during the group interviews. As one participant suggested, put notices up where people can see. So while, you know, while waiting for a bus and, oh, free call and I'll just ring, referring to posters or something like that. Events or opportunities for people to listen to the recordings in groups were also suggested. As one person said, in schools they could have a place like where they usually go for assembly so they can have a special time for this when they want to get information. So my principal or whoever's responsible at the time, they can turn on and listen with the students because they're our future. So those were some of the suggestions about increasing awareness of the service. So I'll just summarise the findings. Um, knowledge of the information hotline was low overall and the usage was also low, but participants generally thought the hotline was a good idea and that it should be continued. And their suggestions were mainly about increasing awareness of the hotline. Now, also, I just want to mention two other findings that came out strongly. The first one was much discussion that uh, happened during the group interviews about the need to improve mobile network coverage. Participants argued that network coverage is weak and inconsistent, it's patchy and it comes and goes. And I experienced as well the outages that happen with the network going on and off, uh, particularly in Central and South Bougainville. 
there was a noticeable difference between the network quality in North Bougainville and weaker, uh, less reliable network in South and Central Bougainville. There were also requests for improvements to other communication mediums, particularly radio broadcasting, and again, especially in Central and South. And the people asked me to emphasize to you that they really do want to see um, much improved radio station signals. The final finding that really struck me was uh, electricity and or lack of electricity access. And this photo shows uh, some participants' phones charging during a group interview. Um, and also in other places, I noticed that people were trying to charge their mobile phones during the group interviews, taking advantage of having some electricity access. Um, keeping the batteries charged is obviously a constant battle for mobile phone owners and clearly is a challenge for them, but also hampers communication projects. It means that they might not receive a robocall if the battery is flat, they might not receive a text message or SMS and so on. The published paper also refers to literature, but I'm going to leave it there for now, having presented the main findings, and I'm going to throw to Adriana to talk about the way forward in terms of communications in Bougainville. Thanks. Thank you, Amanda. So um, on the outset, as you have seen, um, there is no one magic solution to solving the communication issues in Bougainville. We have learned from this experience that doing effective communications in Bougainville is expensive. Um, it must be multi-channeled as no one audience um, group has access to one communication um, channel or medium. Uh, we have also learned that through the implementation of the information, the telephone hotline service, um, that there are real benefits to mobile phone based applications um, in locations with poor media access. And this includes overcoming the literacy challenges um, and having control of information where everyone receives um, the same information at the same time and from the same source. Um, it also works in remote areas that have no access uh, to the mainstream media channels, um, radio, print, or TV. And people can really see the benefit of such a service even if they didn't use it. Um, however, in a region such as Bougainville, um, even mobile platforms has its limitations, um, including um, having an unpredictable network reach and often falls short of what um, the mobile operator says that they can provide. So people also, they do not have access to a reliable power source as we, as we just saw. And um, this sometimes leave people's phones um, going off for a while until the next time that they can recharge the batteries again. So for a new service such as the telephone um, information hotline service, a lot of awareness needs to be done um, to educate people on how to use this service. Um, and this needs to be integrated also into community engagement activities um, as per the Bougainville audience research findings. Um, where people have shown a great preference for more face-to-face -face, um, communications. So effective communications will again be critical in the post-referendum period. However, we also foresee um, similar changes in, con similar challenges, sorry, in content development um, due to the sensitivities, sensitivities of this political issue. Um, the newly elected president, Ismail Torawama, um, has stated his government's commitment and intention of communicating better with the people um, over the next five years. And this has also established um, the government's commitment to improving communications in Bougainville, uh, not only in terms of inf infrastructure, but also in terms of um, the political and uh, government commitment to media and communications on a more holistic level, um, including uh, for content development. Um, and this commitment has also been further strengthened by other members of the new Bougainville House of Representatives. And so we look forward to this renewed commitment from the government uh, over the next five years. Um, this was one of the biggest challenges that we had in the implementation of the IVR. Uh, with regards to content as um, everything was dependent upon government decisions being made by the, by the Bougainville government and also by the national government. Um, but on the contrary, this also pushed out our timeline in getting the project delivered on time as per the initial timeframe. 
So even though we wanted to get the project delivered on time, we also had to ensure that the content was accurate, credible, and also jointly approved by both governments. So speed of the project was sacrificed in order for us to get the information um, correct. Um, going forward, we will continue to explore use of um, mobile phone-based awareness in Bougainville. There is a continuous increase of people's access to 3G handsets, um, which also means that internet and social media access will continue to rise um, steadily in Bougainville. There are, however, impacts of rising access to smartphones that will need to be considered, uh, such as false information or rumors on social media. And we believe that this can be addressed through consistent fact checking and quickly responding to correct any misinformation that may be out there. So um, the IVR or the telephone hotline service can also potentially support the exercise of um, myth busting as well. Overall, getting the people to be fully engaged and participating in such an innovative communication method is paramount. Uh, we know that people want the information, but do they want to spend time or money, or do they want to put in the effort to getting that information? Um, as seen in the 2017 and 2019 audience studies that was conducted um, in Bougainville, people, people see um, access to information as a right. Um, they also see information service delivery and other developments such as new schools or better roads or health facilities um, they see that as a sign of the growing maturity of the Bougainville government. And so the new government, through the president, who is also the Minister for Media and Communications, um, has clearly outlined his, and his intention to maintain consistent um, communication with the people of Bougainville through this post-referendum process. And the government also understands that you know, people can only support and they can only participate meaningfully in this process um, when they know and they understand fully what the government is doing. So it is in this context that um, my office, the Directorate of Media and Communications, will continue to take um, a multi-channel approach to communications in Bougainville uh, with the Telephone Information Service as a readily available platform um, to be used. So uh, with that, I will just invite my counterpart, Jeremy, to just um, share a few words and also to wrap up this um, presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Adriana. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think a lot's been covered here. Um, just some final takeaway points are, are really just to emphasise that um, information as a right. I think clearly the referendum showed um, the, what a positive impact or positive contribution um, the population made to the referendum. Um, it was a peaceful referendum, it was an informed referendum. And so I think in the going forward, um, the, the same, if not a more intensive information approach will, will be needed. And I, and I think mobile needs to be part of that mix whilst um, radio continues to not cover the, the, the whole region and newspapers, you know, 5,000 copies a day um, in urban centres are, are being delivered. So I think mo mobile does um, provide um, the ability to to reach down to people um, and there's a hotline running at the moment in Bougainville for uh, COVID um, for the emergency response there so um, you know phone phones are being used and they do provide a way to be both two-way um, not just one way um, but I also remark on the you know also with COVID we've been trying to do use the same IVR platform um, to provide information for, for COVID, particularly this sort of fact-checking um, information that's required, you know, in, in, in the social media world where there's a lot of misinformation going around. And it does provide a way to, to, to provide a cons consistent sort of uh, message from, from, from the experts or from government authorities. But again, um, that project has been held up in terms of getting the information signed off. So there's a lot of, kind of there's a lot to do with, I guess, the political, cultural, factors to do with um, getting information signed off and, and, and uh, allowing a, a lot of information to go out on a platform, um, not directly from, from the leaders or the, the president. So I think it's really heartening to, uh, that the new president has um, sort of talked about this commitment to communications as a, a way of empowering people. So 
Um, this look, this pilot was always meant to to find to find the problems and find the opportunities, and I and I think it's clearly clearly showing that to us all. Okay, great. Thank you to the three of you. Um, shows what wonderful communicators you are, um, but also what wonderful timekeepers you are. I've had to chair a number of sessions on Zoom, and the hardest thing is to actually sort of weigh in whenever people are going over time. So they said they would take. Uh, 40 minutes and they took 39 minutes and 52 seconds. So that's pretty, pretty impressive. Um, we've got a number of really interesting questions that I'm just going to throw out to the group and you can decide which one, which of you um, you want to um, uh, uh, answer yourself. Um, the first one, which is actually the second one is from touches on something that you mentioned, Jeremy, um, about COVID-19, um, but also touches on something that is implicit in some of your conversations, which is about the ubiquity of social media in Bougainville and about the feedback loops and the kind of instant, uncontrollable, dynamic feedback loops that they bring. Um, so the question is, how can a sustainable version of this project be continued to counter issues when there is an onslaught of misinformation and uh, information on social media platforms? This was a major challenge that arose during the 2020 Bougainville general election. So you've got this very sort of slow, deliberative, sort of thoughtful, um, must get sign off from, uh, from people project, but yet you've got this world that we all live in, a world of instant feedback loops uh, of people pinging us information from all different quarters. So how can we, how can a project like this kind of work within the realities of this hyper-connected, hyper-opinionated world that we, that we live in. I can, I, I can have a crack at that. Uh, in terms of um, working to do on, on the referendum with the Bougainville Referendum Commission, we, we had a lot of this um, need to, to fact check um, the conversation on social media. Um, it, it really does need political or leadership will and, and, and approval from leaders and confidence from leaders in their communications uh, experts. So, um, it's <clears throat> for me. It was sort of um, leadership from the BRC to 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 be across what the the key information, the talking points needed to be, but then to be able to be empowered to to correct information on social media. Um, and I think you can uh, IVR can uh, these audio files can be turned around very quickly. Um, but again, it's it's the levels of it's the layers of, of sign off. So. Um, I guess with, with, with the Bougainville government, it's, it's, it's the leaders, um, you know, empowering the, the, the Directorate of Media Communications, Adriana, to, um, to deliver that information and, and turn it around because uh, we've got the capability in, in Bougainville to, to do that. Um, I, I think a lot of it's around just the ap approval of the information, but, um, but certainly, uh, I, people are accessing social media on their phones and so it's not a leap um, to access uh, something like an IVR on their phone. Mm. Yeah and often some of the most um, uh, sort of um, eloquent or disquisitional of, uh, of people who are actually on social media are the political leaders that mm. you, fi you find it difficult to actually find to get sign off to. So I mean it's a real conundrum or a corollary this thing. I mean I was involved just for the speakers in, in helping, helping or hindering, I'm not quite sure which, um, Adriana and Jeremy in the production of these um, messages. And they're right, it took a long time to actually, the, the situation kept changing, um, dates kept changing, definitions kept changing. But there was a practical problem, which was actually finding people to get the sign off. Um, I think Jeremy and I spent if you did a kind of Strava heat map, we would have gone up and down from the, from the Bougainville <laughs> office. Um, in Hygiene down to Booker to, to try to find people to actually get the sign off and that's contributed to it as well. Um, we've got a question from Ben Grubb, um, which might, you might be sort of, Amanda, you might be best placed to, um, to, to answer, which is, um, quote, given the experience of the pilot for the referendum, could you foresee using a similar model for engaging communities for future information services and engagements in PNG or other country contexts? If yes, are there opportunities for others to piggyback off the technologies, platforms, and partnerships that you helped establish? Obviously, COVID is a 
is an obvious one, but you've got the 2022 election coming up. You've got this sort of consultation phase between Bougainville and PNG that is incipient um, at present. So what, what, what sort of learning can we take from, uh, from this and apply it elsewhere, whether in PNG or another context? Yes, uh, I think that uh, the, um, there is obviously potential for something like this to be used elsewhere. Uh, I guess the, um, the good thing is that there are some learnings from this that can be really useful for uh, technology um, you know, or, or development organisations that are trying to set something up like this. So one of the key things that we found, of course, was that uh, the plan was that every single Digicel mobile phone in Bougainville would receive a, a phone call and would, if they answered the phone call, would hear the um, the voice of the president. And so when I was trying to find out, well, how many of the calls, how many of the phones rang, how many of the calls were answered, how many of the... Um, the calls were listened to through to the end and so on. Uh, it wasn't possible to get this information. And the reason I even thought to ask that was because so many of the people I was meeting for the group interviews did not even know about the phone call and had not heard of anyone who had received such a phone call. So clearly there was a, there was a breakdown with that. And um, obviously that would be useful for people who are planning projects elsewhere to think, well, it might be a great idea for people to hear um, a phone call, but are they going to have their mobile phone batteries charged? What's a good time of day to reach them? Is it technically possible for us to do this number of phone calls and so on? So I think there's definitely some lessons that can be learned from this exercise that can be applied elsewhere for sure, uh, including of course, um, we haven't talked a lot about mobile literacy yet, but certainly there were some people who were saying to me that they were not clear on how to do the, um, you know, pressing two to hear information about a particular topic or pressing three or going back to the main menu and so on. So that limited numeracy and literacy uh, was another factor. So I think um, applying this elsewhere might definitely be possible or applying it again in Bougainville might definitely be possible. But if it was to be applied in a different country, I guess you would have to think about that particular context regarding type of phone, um, you know, those various things that I've just mentioned in the local context. So if there was one thing that you could change, what would it be? If there's one thing that you said, God, I wish I'd really known that before I was, what, what I knew at the end, what I didn't know at the beginning, what would it be that you would, um, you would change? Yeah, um, I think for us, um, as, as um, we've seen in the presentations that, that has just been done, um, uh, the, the project kind of was, was rushed right at the end. So yeah. we did not really um, have time for, you know, to do a proper um, awareness or to educate people um, as how we would have wanted so that they would, we would, we would have had more, you know, engagement from the public and people would be, um, you know, listening in to the messages every week and calling into the hotline. Um, so I think the awareness aspect of the, um, of the project of the, of the IVR was something that, um, you know, at the end we, you know, when you look back, you think, okay, this is something that, you know, we really could have done um, better, but because of the other um, issues of the approvals and getting the content, um, done on time and approved and getting the joint, you know, approvals from the leaders, that was um, quite a bit of a hassle for us. And, you know, by the time we got to, got to the delivery of the actual project, we just, you know, it, it was just rushed into. So yeah, that's um, probably one of the biggest things that um, uh, when we look back on, we think, you know, this is something that we really could have done better. And may I add that that relates as well to the uh, to the people only calling once, um, and that was because the project was designed to have eight weeks worth of messages on each topic, and the messages built upon one another, and there was a story to tell with lots of information. Uh, but some people, uh, or indeed, I found that um, there seemed to be. Uh, not much awareness about that during the discussions. People didn't necessarily realise that the messages were changing weekly. So that obviously then um, had a flow on effect about the number and type of calls, so that the amount of engagement, because as Adriana said, the awareness perhaps hadn't been done as might have been hoped. I, I'd say, Gordon, um, and it's sort of come, coming back to Ben's question, um, there's, there's a few things with, to, with the platform affords 
um, to be explored for, for other locations as, as well as Bougainville. And we, we, didn't, we didn't do them in Bougainville because we would, um, just wanted to test. Um, we we're already sort of loading up a lot of new things like the robocall and I mean, the whole system was an innovation. So, but there are other functionalities that you can include to make the content more compelling. And I think that's, you know, the data clearly shows that some people didn't find it compelling enough to either call or they didn't know. Um, and that is, um, yeah, again, who, who's doing the information, but you can also plug in a, a channel that has, you know, music, uh, you know, the latest, a, a new track every week for people to listen to, uh, shipping news, um, weather information, you know, there's the ability to, to program in another channel um, to take people to it, because I think in the application elsewhere, um, the Everyone, I mean, the, 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 the voter turnout um, and the, the result in Bougainville show how, how engaged everyone was in the referendum. For another kind of topic, um, you might not have um, a theme or a topic that, that people are as interested in getting information from. And, and from, for at the moment, for example, COVID in, in Bougainville at the moment, people aren't as engaged in that. Um, you need something else to bring people to the service. And I think the, the IVR does avail um, do, doing, doing that. And, and, I, and another thing is, I think, you know, any, any, any pilot, because it's sort of, it's there and then it's not. Um, I think Bogan, you know, contexts like Bougainville suit um, long drawn out sort of initiatives that people can get used to. Um, and there's no, because of the way that the model, the model is, is that the cost of an IVR is, is, the, is the background setting up the platform and then the call cost. So there's really no reason why um, you couldn't run this for three months or six months as long as uh, the project had the money to cover uh, people calling it. And uh, now we have a better idea of sort of what the call volume might be. You can, you can start to sort of program that. So I think there's some other takeaways for the application elsewhere. Okay, that's great. I mean, I think, as I said uh, at the beginning of this, I mean, one of the great values that I took from reading this really excellent report and listening to our three speakers is that they talk about uh, missteps or things they would have done differently or things that if I had, a, had, a, had it a different way, I would do it this way. We so rarely talk about that in the context of uh, international development projects. And I think that's what makes this, um, this research so compelling because I think we've all been in projects which have, have been mugged by reality. Um, and I think that this project is an example um, of that. We've all been in projects where we've planned a lot, um, but often there's a mad rush at the end as there was with the, with the referendum. Um, I've got another question coming in here. I like questions that begin, I'm not sure if it's okay to ask, because that means that you know that it's going to be a good question. Um, the question is from John Kemeroy, and he says, I'm not sure if it's okay to ask, but quote, what was the most costly activity and phase of the whole project in terms of time and money? So, you know, how much did the project cost? Um, yeah, so Gordon, I'm happy to jump in because in our published paper, we do state quite clearly that the cost of the hotline service for the set period was approximately 70,000 Australian dollars. And as Jeremy has mentioned, roughly half of that cost was in setting up this service because Digicel didn't have a platform like this in existence already with four options and so on. And then the other half of the cost covered um, the phone calls and uh, and things like that um, related costs. So for comparison purposes, the printing and distributing of the Bougainville Bulletin, when it comes out each edition of 30,000 copies, that costs about 35,000 Australian dollars. So half of the cost of the hotline for every edition of the Bougainville Bulletin, as I understand it. I'm not sure if Jeremy and Adriana want to add. Yeah, that's right. And, and uh, to John's question on timing, um, it really, the main time was, uh, you know, there was a bit of time talking with Digitel about the tech and uh, staff changes affected that. But I'd say the real time for all of these, as well as, you know, the COVID hotline that Adrian and I, Adrian and I have been working on, it's really the, the scripting that takes the time um, for, 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 for the communicators. But the real time is, is just waiting for approval. And, and getting sign off. Driving up and down that road to, um, to uh, the office. So I've got a question from, um, so one question I can answer very quickly for is from Colin Cowell, which is, well, I can answer the first of his questions quickly, but not the second. How many participants engaged in today's webinar? 61. How many participants are from Bougainville? I don't know. My sense from kind of looking at some of the names is probably about a quarter, maybe a third. 
um, but uh, we can get that information to you. Um, uh, Junior Novera um, writes, makes a really important point where he talks about, he said, one of the issues I see is the lack of understanding of the messages or calls made. So it's not just a mobile literacy point, but one about not just a question of like, do I press one, two or three? Um, but uh, a question about how do you absorb um, pretty complex concepts like what is greater autonomy? Um, what is weapons disposal? What does section 290 of the Papua New Guinea constitution say about the consultation phase? Um, what, are, what are the practical approaches to address this gap? Which, which I guess gets into issues about education, about um, the complexity of the operating system of the Bougainville Peace Agreement. Um, and the, the, really the question, which is 19 years after it was signed, um, as the audience research finds, still pretty limited knowledge of, of that. So I'm not sure who wants to take a crack at that question. And then we've got another one from Tess Newton Kane that I'm, I'll t I've teed up and I'll, I'll ask once you've answered that one. So how do you deal with broader questions of literacy um, rather than just the mobile literacy, which is sort of easy to deal with in a way? Uh, maybe I'll just yeah, mention wanna, that. I'll throw it up to Adriana, do you want to have a go at that one? In terms Sorry, of the, when Adriana, the before Adriana, I'll just say that people generally did know quite a lot about the referendum. I noticed in the immediate weeks leading up to the referendum, there'd been a huge amount of awareness on, on done on foot by teams of people going out and so on. So there was quite a lot of awareness uh, by the time, you know, in just in the weeks immediately leading up to the referendum. But I'll hand over to Adriana. Thank you. So um, I think that has um, that has to do with the de content development and you know um, taking into consideration issues such as um, the language type of language use. You know mm -hmm. how the how the um, um, the the structure of the um, of the different audio messages was done. You know how we had to really simplify that um, from from what it was like. From for example, if it was a decision coming out from one of the joint supervisory body meetings. And then for us having to simplify that into, you know, um, plain language and then having that um, translated into Tokpisina. Yeah. So we had to um, follow through that process to make sure that the audio messages that we got onto the, on the, on the mobile platform system um, were as um, simple, very simple and easy to people to understand. And I think we also did some, did some um, audience testing before we actually had the, um, the, the launch of the of the project. So um, we did that. We had to make sure that the messages were all simplified and um, translated into talk piscine as per you know the audience needs. And also um, we were able to have them tested, pre-tested out um, with small groups, uh, small focus groups, um, before we had the um, actual launching of the of the project. So I think those are some ways that um, we follow through in the content development of the IVR and um, is probably a good um, process to follow going forward for um, um, developing content for the, for the post referendum yeah. as well, yeah. No, it's, it's yeah. a good point. And, and it's, I, I think it's also something that is a real challenge. It would challenge any country or any place in the world, the complexity of, this, of the, the operating system within, within Bougainville that you're trying to communicate. Um, I print, I recently did this because I read it in an article and I wanted to see if it was actually true where someone said, if you printed off all the documents that made up the Bougainville peace agreement, the changes to the PNG constitution, the organic law, the Bougainville constitution, the report of the constitutional planning commission, it would total over a thousand pages. And I didn't really believe that, but I did print it off. Um, and it came to one, well over a thousand pages. It's incredibly difficult. Um, to to communicate. Um, I think this is going to be Gordon. The, the, uh, sorry, it's it's five o'clock. So Amanda's given me a very strict instruction on this. So I'm going to actually do what I'm told for once, um, which is we're going to have what I think is sometimes the best part of these sessions. Normally, if this if we were all meeting in person, we would go and have a drink with each other. And um, but what we're going to do now is we're going to sort of close the formal part um, of this um, of this meeting. If you, if you wish to leave, you're more than welcome to leave. But if you wish to stay, you're more than welcome to stay. And then I'm not quite sure what's going to happen um, in a couple of minutes, but it will be some sort of Brady Bunch, sort of Truman Show type um, 
thing where we all get to see each other on screens and maybe get to ask the questions that um, that we have um, that we have uh, that we have burning. I see Jennifer Anderson's asked another question. I would love to ask a question about um, uh, what Digicel got out of the um, got out of the project. Um, there's a, I think there's an interesting research to be done about the Irish and PNG. Amanda, maybe you could do that next. Um, but for now, it's just it's been a real honor to uh, have chaired this session. I've really enjoyed it. I really learned a lot. I always learn a lot when I listen to Adriana, Amanda, and Jeremy. And I'll see you on whatever the other side of this is.